G'day, welcome to Lunch Money. Uh, we are the online and social media home for special situations, workouts, and capital raising professionals. My name is Nick Samios. I am the fund manager and director here at Hermes Capital, and uh, I am your Lunch Money host. So uh, a very, very warm welcome to you. Well, um, this week we've had our Prime Minister announce uh, an initiative to uh, give uh, manufacturing uh, a kickstart in this country. He's uh, uh, signaled that there's going to be uh, six different manufacturing uh, specialties or streams uh, that they're going to support. And um, th I wonder whether or not this is going to create a lot of startup opportunities um, for businesses, uh, potentially uh, in the supply chain. It, obviously, a lot of the focus is going to be on existing capabilities and existing manufacturers. Um, but as those uh, as those uh, different sectors are ramped up, then uh, certainly uh, there'll be uh, suppliers and uh, that'll be entering the supply chain, and there'll be um, some some uh, startup opportunities created there. Um, and so we're in the middle of COVID. Would you have to be insane? To, uh, to start a business in this time? This is the question that we are asking. And we have two excellent guests uh, to help us uh, answer that question. And the first guest is Paul Nicolau. G'day, Paul. How are you doing? G'day, Nick. Great to see you and great to be part of your program. Fantastic. Um, now, Paul is a Director of uh, Business Leaders Council at the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And he's also the uh, Ambassador to Startups Australia. Um, tell us, Paul, what is it that, that keeps you busy at the Australian Chamber? Well, Nick, uh, today has been a major uh, has been a major announcement by the federal government in relation to tax release and a reduction of red tape. Uh, the Australian Chamber of Commerce, with the other um, agencies that represent business across Australia, has been working and advocating on behalf of business, small, large, and medium, uh, to bring about changes to help uh, many businesses across Australia survive uh, COVID and also to ensure that uh, businesses survive and continue to grow in the uh, plan going forward for economic recovery. Uh, today, uh, the government announced that uh, there'll be tax relief and uh, fringe benefit changes that will help small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, as from the 1st of July, eligible businesses will be able to immediately deduct certain startup expenses and certain prepaid expenditure, which is really good news. Uh, in addition to that, uh, from the 1st of April, uh, 2021, eligible businesses will be exempt from the 47% fringe benefit tax on car parking, multiple work expenses, such as electronic devices, phones, laptops provided to employees, which is also a big, uh, important cut for uh, businesses. And that goes on top of the government's announcements that you mentioned before uh, in relation to yesterday's big announcement of a $1.3 billion spend on mo uh, modern manufacturing initiatives. Um, and that is in the areas of resource technology, food and beverage, medical products, recycling, clean energy, defence and space. So they're all important if we're going to get our, our economy back and up and running. And a lot of it uh, is due to Andrew Liveris. Andrew Liveris is, was on the National COVID Commission that uh, Scott Morrison set up. And Andrew Liveris was the person that uh, uh, President Obama and President Trump had engaged in America to rebuild manufacturing in, in America. And then wow. uh, uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison engaged Andrew Liveris and uh, he was uh, charged to look at what we can do in relation to manufacturing. So he and the COVID Commission with Nev Power and the Minister Karen Andrews worked tirelessly to put together this uh, modern manufacturing initiative that they announced yesterday. And then you've got today's announcement that both the Josh uh, Friedenberg, the Federal Treasurer, and Michael Sucker, the Assistant Treasurer, with the uh, Assistant Minister for uh, Red Tape, Ben Morton, have been all working together to um, uh, make these changes for tax relief and uh, red tape, the reduction of red tape to help uh, businesses get through COVID and also to get into the, the phase of the economic recovery. Wow. She's, uh, and and uh, the, the Chamber has had uh, a lot to do with, with this in terms of lobbying and... Very much so. Uh, we represent uh, around 300,000 businesses across Australia. Uh, we represent all the state chambers and we also represent over 75 industry associations. That represents businesses across all sectors of the Australian economy. And we've been working with them and also working with the government in managing the COVID crisis, but at the same time, giving the government ideas, suggestions and ways that they could help uh, businesses get through COVID and also to get them up and running for the economic phase, recovery phase of the Australian economy. 
And I appreciate that a lot of the focus would be on existing businesses, but is is there, you know, is there uh, also some attention being paid to startups and helping startups uh, get off the ground? Uh, very much so. As we know, a lot of startups are at the grassroots uh, level, and a lot of the state governments are giving incentives and encouraging uh, small um, startups and fintechs to to grow. Uh, especially in New South Wales, for example, the state government set up a startup hub, and it's also supporting a lot of those startups with financial support, education, and training. And one of the roles of Startup Australia is to also help mentoring and giving uh, advice and also uh, connecting businesses with other people in the uh, businesses that are already up and running. That's, that's fascinating. I had no idea about the uh, the fringe benefits thing, so that is a, that is a lovely surprise. For yeah, well, it's, it's big news, Nick, and uh, yeah, I think yeah. it's going to be helping businesses across Australia do well out of this uh, COVID crisis. Absolutely. I wish you'd given me the heads up about that yesterday. I would have uh, gone long on uh, cafes and restaurants, but uh, yeah, okay. All right, we're going to pop you back into the uh, waiting room there, Paul, and then we're going to introduce our next guest, uh, Stephen Fallon. G'day, hey. Stephen. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing, Nick? Very good. Now, Stephen's a dis- distinguished professor at uh, Fayetteville State University in North Carolina. I've got That's the right correct. Carolina, don't I? Fantastic. But, of course, you'll, you'll hear from the accent that he's actually uh, from Melbourne originally. Um, but uh, you've been in uh, North Carolina, well, you've been in the States for eight years, uh, and you've recently released a book, Startup Stories, Lessons for Everyday Entrepreneurs, and there'll be a link to that book in our promotional material. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what, what it is you do and a little bit about the book? Sure. So I'm a professor of entrepreneurship here at Fayetteville State University. Uh, Fayetteville State is uh, one of the constituent institutions of the University of North Carolina system. It's actually the second oldest campus in the system and closest to the largest military base in the United States, Fort Bragg, which is home to the 82nd Airborne and Special Forces and Delta Force, which a lot of uh, listeners may have heard about. Yeah. So we have a large uh, military population that we serve in addition to the rest of our students. Uh, we're also a historically black university here, so we have a lot of the, the history there that we're uh, living right now. So it's, it's a, a wow. very interesting experience to be here in North Carolina at this time. The book itself comes from my experience of teaching entrepreneurship for the last 20 years. And a lot of students, about 400,000 students a year take entrepreneurship classes in the United States, but very few of them actually leave their program starting businesses. Uh, and some people think that that's a problem, and I, I sort of think it isn't a problem. I think uh, successful business owners tend to have 10 years industry experience before they get into their successful venture, at least, uh, in other cases, even longer than that. So I think it's unrealistic to think that a college student is just going to come straight out and be the next Mark Zuckerberg or uh, you know, uh, Steve Jobs and is going to start a billion-dollar enterprise. In fact, when you look at the data and the real numbers, you find out that most uh, startups are coming from people who are in the trade, for example, uh, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, you know, they tend to work for somebody and then after a period of time, once they've learned the ropes, they go out on their own and they start their own business. So so we think of the typical entrepreneur as the billionaire Steve Jobs type, but actually we should be thinking about the, the chippy or the sparky or somebody like that as your, as your prototypical entrepreneur. So, well, let, let, let me just pause you there for a sec because I do have a couple of slides I was going to show in the introduction. First one is who we normally think of as entrepreneurs. Uh, and here we have uh, the usual, you know, we've got uh, Elon Elon Musk and uh, Dick Smith for a bit of Australian flavour there and uh, Jerry Harvey. But let me show you who I think about when I think of an entrepreneur and Paul Nicolau may have some affiliation. That is my family on my dad's side uh, starting up a cake shop in Bankstown in the 50s. And we go even further back than that. Uh, We have... My grandfather. So there you go. Uh, my, they, they were. St- we I have startups in the family, but they're a little bit more mundane than uh, than sort of inventing new software p- p- programs. So you, you, your book, you, you talk about different um, different uh, levels of, of of entrepreneur, and it just seems very grounded. It's very realistic. Do you want to just talk us through that for a bit? Yeah, so I think uh, depending on how you define entrepreneurship, literally everybody can be thought of as an entrepreneur at some level or another. So even just managing your own personal human capital, your skills, your knowledge, your contacts and so forth throughout your career is a form of entrepreneurship. Every day you have to wake up and think, how am I going to spend my time? How am I going to invest my time and my money in developing myself as an individual? And that's an entrepreneurial act. So 
at the at the base level, almost everyone is an entrepreneur in that sense. And then, of course, you can go on to self-employment, gig economy. If you go and drive an Uber car, you go and sell something online on eBay, you're, you're doing something that's entrepreneurial. So, uh, so you can go through these different levels. I define six different levels in the book that you can ascend to, but you don't have to start at the top. In fact, you can start at any level that you want. And obviously, the more complicated, the more money that's invested, the more risk that's involved, the bigger the undertaking it is. But uh, there's really no shame and no stigma to starting at any of those levels, and you can move up and down the hierarchy as you go along. Can I ask you a question? It's a bit of a a sacred cow, and I'm going to be very daring here. Whenever anybody talks about entrepreneurship, they always talk about passion. You know, you've got to have something you're passionate about. And I found, you know, I started a business, you know, 10 years ago. And and whilst I am passionate about what I do, to be quite frank with you, I don't have enough, I don't have really time to think about a passion. Is that something that you found or is it, you know, is there a lot of emotion in it? Because as I say, you've looked at all levels. Um, I mean, how much does, does that come into it or is that just a dream? I mean, in an ideal situation, you want to be loving what you're doing, I guess. Uh, What we do find in the research is that entrepreneurs tend to get paid less working for themselves than they would if they were working for someone else with the same level of skills and experience. But they're also the profession that has the number one job satisfaction, at least here in the US. So so there's enormous satisfaction in working for yourself for a certain individual, right? So if you value autonomy, you value making your own decisions and so forth, then there's a wonderful experience that you can create for yourself doing that. So uh, it, it's horses for courses, right? And there's some people are going to be attracted to that lifestyle. Uh, at the end of the day, you've got to pay the bills, as you realize, right? You've got to temper that passion with realism and say, you know, is this is this something that's also someone's going to pay for? So I'm very anti just find something you love and just go and do that because I think it, it can lead you down some dark paths in terms of revenue generation. <laughs> you then talk about the employer, entrepreneur, which is uh, obviously the job creator. Um, and, uh, I mean, is that, a linear, is that a linear progression? Or I guess you said you can sort of jump in anywhere, I suppose. Yeah, I think uh, there's a certain level of skills that you have to develop to operate at different levels. So if you're an employer entrepreneur, clearly you have to know how to manage employees, how to onboard them, to train them, to motivate them. Uh, how to get rid of the ones that aren't working out and so forth. And, there, and as you know, there's a certain level of skill that's involved in doing that. That's something that can be learned and acquired over time. So you shouldn't just expect to naturally have those things when you start a business and it's something that most people have to work at. And so you tend to find when you speak to people who've been entrepreneurs for a long time, who may have owned different businesses, they talk about building up their experiences, their knowledge base, often through errors and mistakes and you know, learning the hard way. I, I have someone in the book who failed multiple times to start a business and now he's about to hit $100 million in revenue this year in wow. his import-export business, you know, but uh, he, he'll be the first one to tell you, <laughs> you know, I really screwed up a few times. Wow. Well, yeah, okay, gee, $100 million, yeah, you, you'd have to you'd have to find a way of making money out of that. That's, uh, that's <laughs> cool. uh, It's interesting. I mean, I don't know if you listen to Scott Adams at all, but he talks about the, the talent stack. And, mm-hmm. uh, and building the talent stack. So that sounds a little bit like what you're talking about there. This will, we will uh, bring Paul Nicolau back. Okay. I would like to start off by showing um, showing a Twitter exchange that is actually the genesis of this uh, this show today. Uh, I'm going to read it to you. I, I tweeted, and I shouldn't tweet, and I apologise, but I tweeted, um, uh, could it be that some young job seekers opt for some form of entrepreneurialism to create jobs for themselves and others? If traditional jobs are scarce, way of life changing equals fertile ground for innovation, policy settings, etc. So this was in, res- in response to Stephen Kukulis saying the government basically needs to pump money into the economy to uh, to keep things long. And I'm, I'm saying, well, maybe maybe we should en- encourage entrepreneurialism to, to actually have young people creating jobs. And then I've had this guy come back and say, sorry, mate, I call BS. Only people that can afford to be young entrepreneurs are those with rich folks. Entrepreneurship involves failing a lot. You need experience and capital that comes from a job to eventually succeed. Odd exceptions do exist. Lender culture is anti-startup. Now, I will say to this guy, um, he we exchanged a little bit more, and I, I think he he's actually been in business for 20 years, it turns out, and I guess he probably, it sounds like he's probably been to the school of hard knocks, and you know, he said that he's successful these days, but I'm, I, I think he's carrying a few scars, um, judging from that tweet. 
But I mean, do you do you need to have rich parents to to start a business, Stephen? The answer is no, and not in every case. And so, you know, we we use the term bootstrapping to refer to people that start up their business without drawing on external resources, external funding, and so forth. And it turns out there's a, a, several techniques that you can use where you can start your business without needing that external funding, without needing loans, without needing to to go to the bank with cap in hand. Uh, particularly difficult, of course, if you don't have any collateral or anything that they can secure. Uh, the easiest one to think about off the top of anyone's head is crowdfunding. So if you look at the uh, crowdfunding movement, for example, you're basically in product crowdfunding, pre-selling your product uh, and taking that revenue and using it to develop the product and eventually send it out to the market. So it's it's a way of funding your re- research and development, if you like, or your your uh, uh, production with uh, other people's money, right? And so they're giving that to you and you don't have to borrow it. You don't have to find any way of raising that money. So product crowdfunding is a great example where you can uh, have negative working capital. If you like, you've already got the money in the bank and you're using that to build your product. Right. Well, what, what do you think, Paul? Um, do, you, do you need to have uh, rich parents necessarily to, to start a business? I don't, I don't know about your lineage, Paul, but but my family certainly came to Australia with nothing and, and they went into business. But uh, I don't know what's it's very different these days. What what do you think? Look, you, you don't need um, rich parents. Um, yes, there are circumstances where, you know, people who do have access to rich parents can help um, get their um, businesses up and running. And you're right. I mean, if you look at the, the first Greek, the first cinemas in Australia were from people of Greek background when they came here. A lot of the Greek Australians and even Italians who came to Australia in the early times came with no money. You know, they literally came with just the clothing on their back and probably a few other items themselves. And they started up the cafes, the fruit shops, the fish shops. Um, and then they did did very well. Um, and they basically had to work hard. They either worked at, uh, uh, I know with my own father, worked at General Motors Holden. And so he was able to earn income so he could bring his family across and start up a business. Um, and that's how that sort of helped um, the, grow the Australian economy over time. I mean, there was a huge migration push that came in to help build the Snowy Mountain schemes. And a lot of those people earned an income as a result of those jobs and then went off and set up their own cafes or their restaurants or their businesses um, and that's where you can sort of see how over time, um, you know, businesses grew in Australia. Um, I think some of the other comments are, are, are quite correct in that um, this is where a Startup Australia and other organisations, state government, set up these hubs to help um, people who haven't got the money to set up their uh, businesses. Uh, in Sydney, they've got the Sydney Startup, and, and that's where they're giving um, businesses some money to, to seed a lot of these little businesses and also to provide the back-end operations to, to make those businesses uh, grow and, and continue to be successful. Right. Okay. Yeah. Look, uh, it's interesting. I know that uh, my, you know, my grand, you know, my grandparents. The, the way it used to happen is that, you know, you'd start out and then, um, you know, you'd have a bit of success. You make a bit of money, and you'd actually uh, provide what we would today call seed capital to the next guy that got off the boat to help them start a milk bar, you know, in the town a uh, 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 hundred miles away. Um, I, I just wanted to. I've got another slide here. The one about courage. Um, so courage is knowing it might hurt. And doing it anyway, stupidity is the same, and that's why life is hard. I've often wondered whether or not, you know, starting, you, you do have to be insane to start a business at any time. Once you actually know uh, the pain and grief that you have to go through uh, when you go through those early phases, I'm wondering about um, education uh, for people starting a business. And, and Stephen, obviously, you're in the education game. Um, you know, what, what, what's the role of the sort of, uh, how, how, do, how do universities best uh, train entrepreneurs. I mean, the MBA, for example, uh, is is a favourite form of a degree, but it, to me that gives you the language if you're going to be in a big corporation. Um, but is that the right approach for, for a budding entrepreneur? So uh, you, it's a tough question for me to answer because I teach entrepreneurship students in the MBA program here. And so, uh, right. and so I have to say, absolutely, it's awesome going to do an MBA. But uh, you know, I think there's been a shift over time in how it's done. It's a, we don't teach from a, a, a theory perspective anymore. It's very much experiential. When I teach entrepreneurship, it's get out of the building, go and talk to customers, do do things, take concrete actions to start things. So, uh, one of the things I do is I have a course called you know the first hundred days. And you know, what do you need to actually practically get a business off the ground in a hundred days? And you know, how do you register a business? How do you go and set up your tax accounts? How do you get an accountant, a lawyer? How do you build a website? 
website? How do you do all of this sort of thing? And so, you know, often you criticise as being in this ivory tower, but um, it's very much my perspective that it's, it's hands-on and, and actually going out and, for me, c- curating the best practice and the best content that's out there, telling people how it is, maybe things that they don't realise, they give them a realistic chance of what it takes to be successful, pointing them, making connections, networking, connecting them to people that could help them succeed. And then, as you say, learning about failure and you know, trying it and realising it's not as easy as it looks. Look, certainly networks are gold. Uh, I know, Paul, you, you are a, a networker extraordinaire. Um, what, what, what would you add to that in terms of uh, education? Does, what, what does the Chamber do? Uh, the Chamber must get involved in education to some extent. Look, the state chambers do. Um, They offer a whole range of courses online. Uh, Also, the federal government and the state governments, because of COVID, have have ploughed a lot of money into training online um, and also uh, funding uh, courses at university, but also funding courses at TAFE. Uh, And it's not just universities, it's also the online uh, courses that are being provided by government, but also the TAFE programs that are uh, in, on available now for lots of people. And a lot of the state governments are offering um, uh, f- uh, free uh, courses uh, through TAFE because a-, a lot of kids think that just going to university is the only course of action. Whereas if you look at TAFE, it offers opportunities for people to become electricians and and other uh, trade uh, courses are available and we're looking for I mean we just don't need all, more econom- economists or we need more lawyers or or but we do need um, you know we do need electricians and, and carpenters and so on so it is important that um, we give uh, everyone the opportunity and education is important um, whether it is university or whether it is uh, TAFE or whether it's online, there's so much available now that uh, they can get access to it, and it is not a, it's not a cost exercise. Well, as you say, I mean, it's uh, like let's let's take manufacturing for example. I mean, okay, there's the manufacturing plant, but but you know the, the people that are going in and out of that plant, there's there's subbies that do electrical contracting, there's subbies that do mechanical and uh, engineering and IT. Uh, you know, all sort, you know, all, and then maybe some uh, HR consulting and all that sort of stuff. They're all opportunities um, for, 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 for people to start small businesses as subcontractors. But, of course, they need those skills beyond their immediate, uh, their immediate craft or trade, don't they? Uh, you know, they need to be able to, uh, you know, balance the books and do a bit of accounting and uh, maybe, maybe some marketing skills, et cetera, et cetera. We, we were talking before about, um, you know, some, some startups are obviously very exciting and very sexy uh, with respect to, to uh, you know, IT and even Uber, for example. Uh, but but what, how, do we, how do we upskill, uh, Stephen, those, those people who are, you know, say they've got a trade, uh, they've got a specific craft, um, you know, what are the particular challenges to, to upskilling those to act people to actually go from being a great electrician or a great whatever it might be to actually being a great business owner? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there are certain perspectives that you try and bring about, uh, you know, what skill sets require, what mindset is also important. Uh, some of the things is just to get people to realize, you know, personal responsibilities. I mean, the buck ends with you. You're the boss now, you know, and that's, someone's not going to swoop in and take care of things for it. And so all of these problems, they're not going to go away, right? <laughs> You've got to, it's up to you to fix them. And then to, to give people the, an idea about how they might go about fixing those, that it's not all hopeless, that you, you have the capability to do that. I try and, uh, to get people to be proactive about solving things and getting ahead of the pack rather than waiting for things to happen to them. And then just building systems, you know, and, uh, you know, rather than working in the business that you're working on the business, if you're familiar with the E-Myth uh, revisited book uh, by Michael Gerber, um, so that, you know, you, you are the boss who's setting up the system that other people get to operate on your behalf and that, uh, you know, often what happens with trades and craftspeople is they tend to, uh, become the business and the, and the focus of the business, and uh, and they they lose the passion for their trade because they're they're so bogged down with the business side of things. So, teaching people to say, you know, you can't work seven days a week. It's not all about you. You need to build a system that others can step in and and help you run. Right, and that's part of the that's part of what what you teach, I suppose. I do have a question here, Paul. I'm actually uh, I'm just it's from our mutual friend Jim Salakis. Uh, these government initiatives. <laughs> uh, um, these government initiatives are excellent. 
Uh, but we're still stuck with the bank's phobia to lend. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Uh, startups, uh, the ABF TFF program failed. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, what can the government do to get banks to lend? Well, I think that I can I can sort of help that question along. Um, the, uh, the there's been changes were announced uh, late last week uh, to the responsible lending um, laws. These responsible lending laws came in in the last GFC, uh, and I've always taken the view that uh, when, when when those responsible lending laws were introduced into Australia, that they are a reaction to an American problem. We didn't have the sort of crazy no income, no job, no assets loans in Australia quite the way they did in the US. And I've always been of the view that if mum and dad want to sit around the kitchen table and decide to chuck in their jobs and start a business and second mortgage their house, that's their business. But that's that's just my view. What, what do you think, Paul? Oh, look, I, I agree. The government is reluctant to go and just allow money just to be thrown out in the community. They've got to be conscious of the fact that they want these businesses to survive. I mean, the government has been putting out uh, JobKeeper, which has kept a lot of businesses afloat. Um, and they're also concerned of zombie companies or companies that are, are just surviving on the basis of the income they're receiving from the government. The government wants to keep as many people employed as possible, but at the same time also wants to ensure that businesses can get up and running once the uh, uh, the job keeper stops and also once the economy starts going. Uh, banks and other institutions are lending money, but are also conscious of making sure that those businesses are in a position where they can pay and they can survive. It's no good giving businesses money and just assuming that they're going to survive. In this current climate, we just don't know. And there's so many restrictions as a result of COVID. And there's so many uh, changes. I mean, you look at, as a result of COVID, the amount of people that are now shopping online has been, has accelerated to the nth degree. And you're looking at a whole range of retail businesses that now, um, you know, are going to struggle to survive because people are just getting used to buying things online. Um, so you've got to be conscious of the way we are going to be going forward uh, post-COVID. Uh, we can't assume it's going to be the same. I mean, people assume that we're all going to just do go back to doing events face-to-face. -face. Well, uh, we've found that Zoom and other platforms have changed the way we do business. Uh, gone are the days where people will just fly down to Melbourne or to Sydney for a one-hour meeting. Um, they will do less of that, which will have a big impact on hospitality and tourism. So... Government is conscious of the fact that just opening and lending out money just willy-nilly is not the solution. It, as a government, has to spend money on infrastructure, which they're doing. They're spending money on training and education. They're all the things. There's a multitude of things that the government is doing to ensure that uh, businesses survive, but at the same time are in a position to get up and going once COVID is uh, under control. Look, I have to say, I mean, as you know, I'm, I'm a lender myself, of course. Uh, you know, it's, it's you know, certainly credits available in, in my, well, certainly in the non-bank sector, credits available. The issue is, of course, what you hit upon, which was uncertainty. And, uh, you know, people, they, they don't know what's around the corner. Even now, we don't know, you know, the certain insolvency laws are changing, what have you, and we don't know what it's going to be like. We, people aren't quite certain where to invest or how to invest. Uh, what's going to work and what's not going to work. And, and industries are changing. I mean, you mentioned there about the um, the change in, in shopping behaviours, for example. And I, I've been buying stuff on uh, like crazy online myself. But, of course, this creates warehousing opportunities. Um, you know, the whole sort of uh, Amazonification of, uh, of the supply chain. What, what's the flow of credit like in the US, Stephen, for um, the, the bank's lending? Yeah, it's, it, I'm just listening to the conversation here and it's such a different philosophy here. And I think I, I sort of lean your way, Nick, and sort of trusting people with their own equity in their home and, and freeing up uh, capital markets in that sense. Uh, uh, the, you know, it's very strange here. I, I was actually a fund administrator for a local angel investment group, for instance, and uh, successful entrepreneurs here love to invest in young entrepreneurs. I mean, uh, you know, we were able to syndicate uh uh, debt instruments and equity instruments of fifty to five hundred thousand dollars within the within the state. There were tax breaks available for uh, angel investors to participate in our funds and so forth. Uh, it's very common for people to tap into their home equity lines of credit. Uh, they were very readily available for uh, anyone who has equity in their home. Uh, you just go down to your local bank or credit union and they'll slap one on there. Yeah, and, uh, you go go ahead and use it. I mean, people are using. Uh, credit cards often here to fund their startups uh, and uh, you know like I said you have that crowdfunding where they've just changed the law here so you can have equity crowdfunding now so after the uh, the crash in 1929 they put a lot of rules in place here 
uh, to mean that you couldn't raise money from the general public and everyone had to be an accredited investor, which, which had pretty high barriers to what that meant. Uh, 200,000 annual income or a million in assets, not counting your family home. Right. So very few people <laughs> qualified for that, particularly outside the major cities of New York and, and LA and Chicago. So that's uh, been relaxed now. You can actually have a equity crowdfunding where you can sell to, to smaller investors who might be interested in your business ideas. So just like somebody buys through a product crowdfunding, uh, yeah. like a new coffee mug or whatever, they can they can invest directly in uh, you raising equity for your business. So so a lot of these things, I think, is just a more liberal environment, more trusting of the individual to make their own decisions about their own money. Well, yeah, I mean, the trouble that we had here was, um, I know myself, you know, when you, you, you know, I would have advised, I know this sounds like terrible advice, but my advice until they've changed these laws would be don't quit your job until you have uh, hocked your house because once you once you start the business and you go to the bank and say, look, I've got plenty of equity, but I now need to borrow something to, you know, to put on some staff or whatever it might be, um, the bank says, well, we're terribly sorry, until you can produce two years financial statements uh, showing, you know, showing how your business is going. Yeah, well, hang on, I only started three months ago. Uh, I'm not going to be here in two years if I don't get some support. Um, but that's, I think that's going to, I think that's going to change. The other thing I wanted to say is that we're seeing a lot of um, senior business people getting involved in assisting startups and fintechs, and they're right. giving advice and mentoring, uh, and also themselves are putting some money in there. So um, it's great to see a lot of these corporate leaders doing so because at least they have faith in the the startup or in the fintech, and um, you can see, you know, companies like. Um, Oh, there's a whole range of startups and fintechs that have come as a result of support from business people who've been around for a while. And um, people like John Simons, Harry Triggerboff. I mean, you look at uh, Peter Ritchie from who originally set up McDonald's here in Australia. There are a number of these people who are now supporting a lot of fintechs and smaller uh, startups to get off the ground and uh, putting money in so they've got skin in the game. Well, look, the other thing is, too, like, whilst I'd love to attribute that to uh, to a wonderful spirit and generosity of soul and all that sort of stuff, I mean, the reality is that, you know, interest rates are, you know, 0.25% or whatever they are. And it's very hard to uh, to, to live off that if you're in retirement. Um, and so there is, people are looking for all sorts of opportunities. There's no doubt about it. Um, I was talking to uh, an M&A lawyer uh, just a couple of days ago, and he was saying that there are, you know, that uh, M&A opportunities the ones that there are, they're very hotly contested and that a lot of funds are looking at startups um, because, you know, they're, they're trying to find things to do with their money. Stephen, do you think there are opportunities that, that this sort of COVID environment creates specifically? Well, I don't. I think there's no doubt there are winners and losers uh, in different yeah. industries during this crisis. So, you know, obviously Zoom as a communication tool is absolutely booming, right, and uh, home deliveries and of uh, food and so forth are doing great. And and we know that the losers are hotels and tourism and hospitality and uh, associated industries, right? So it, it's uh, swings and roundabouts, if you like, that, you know, some are up and some are down. Uh, overall, people are pulled back a bit. The savings rates are up. And so people are in, in this wait and see attitude. And I think uh, ultimately being an entrepreneur is about spotting where the pain is, right? So it's it's, you know, what isn't working? So one of the things that's really not working here in the US is kids staying home from school when parents have to work, right? And uh, uh, and here in the US, a lot of uh, parents rely on schools to provide breakfast and lunch as well. I mean, and so, uh, so that's created a real problem. So there's actually been a movement to create teaching pods here of, you know, uh, families coming together to share instruction so that uh, the other parents can go off to work and so forth and hire somebody to come in at certain times. And so that's the entrepreneurial spirit in action to say, you know, let's look at the problems that are being created here and find solutions, just like we saw conversions to ventilator production and mass production and so forth. It's just people stepping up and, and uh, you know, solving problems at the end of the day. It's amazing what you can do with a whiteboard. I, I, I would love to see one of your classes. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure you must get these ideas uh, cranking out where the pain points are. And just in a couple of minutes, there you've, you've come up with a bunch of stuff. We had one of our guests um, a little while back when 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 COVID first hit, and nobody was flying, and he came up with the idea of someone driving around in a Qantas bus uh, delivering, um, you know, the sorts of meals that you get uh, on the aeroplane. Uh, you know. Uh, you, you could sort of play with that and tease it out, and I'm sure you can, you'd come up with something. Look, uh, we are we are running out of time, so I'll ask you, Paul, any sort of um, 
Any closing remarks? Just I just want to agree with Stephen. I mean, there are going to be winners and losers. I mean, you look at it, we Australians spend something in the vicinity last year of $65 billion on overseas travel. Now, that money is now being spent in, in Australia. As we can see, the regional parts of Australia are now benefiting. If you know, A lot of people have left Sydney, a lot of the, the major cities and going into regional parts, whereas a lot of those regional parts suffered because of the droughts and the fires that we had uh, over the last few years. And then in addition to that, the government gave people access to their superannuation funds. And uh, we've seen something in the vicinity of $3 billion come out of the trillions that are in um, superannuation funds. And then all that money has been spent on cars or on face jobs or on all sorts of things, uh, home renovations, etc. So there's going to be a lot of businesses that will benefit as a result. The government's also encouraging biz- uh, home, home people who are renovating their homes or building new homes. They're giving them $25,000 um, to spend on their homes. So they're helping um, small businesses get off the ground and also help existing ones that are, are struggling at the moment. So there's going to be winners and losers out of this thing. Let's hope that there'll be more winners and, and let's hope that uh, we see the back end of COVID sooner rather than later. And let's okay. hope that, uh, you know, the, the businesses do survive and can uh, get up and running uh, uh, post-COVID. Cars versus face jobs. I mean, that is one hell of a choice, isn't it? Even before we, before we say goodbye, any sort of uh, closing thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing the same thing here. I mean, the home renovation businesses are totally booming. And, of course, uh, even I've had contractors tell me that, uh, you know, they've had to turn work down for the first time in their life. And, you know, they've uh, dragged it on as much as they can and made as many promises as they can and just reached the point where they've had to say no. So uh, uh, on the the other financing thing I thought I would mention that's uh, unique to the U.S. is that uh, there's all these technology transfer schemes that also occur here so that, Uh, There are set-asides for small business and research and development and for the major government departments and research laboratories and universities. So you can partner with a university as a non-profit and as a small business to transfer technology and commercialise it, and there's funding available for that. And uh, I think that's a critical part of the equation that maybe Australia could look at, which is how to to get from that great record of patents and inventions through to that commercialisation. There's a real gap in between there of getting over that hump to get something to market. Well, that's fantastic. There you go. There's a bit of Paul, uh, for a bit of a homework for you, Paul. Uh, yeah, yeah. Want to look you. into that. All right. Well, look, I'd encourage uh, I'd encourage people to have a look at Stephen's book. It's a very down to earth uh, look at uh, at startups, um, and uh, and, I, and I found it uh, found it a good read. So thank you very much for joining us, Stephen. You're our first US guest, so uh, it was fantastic. You could make it. I really appreciate it. And thank you very much, Paul. It's been wonderful to have you along, and wonderful to hear what you've been up to. So thank you very much, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.